We are the two largest uh, countries in the world. We have immense power to damage each, each other. And we have immense power to do good together. And by that, I mean, of course, climate, uh, inventing the future of work, uh, working with aging, health, and so on. And our people, really, if you look at them closely, and I'm kind of familiar with a lot of the interactions between these two cultures, really do get along pretty well. I am so pleased uh, to welcome Peter Petri, uh, partly because this is a really cool topic and he has a really uh, informed perspective, and also partly, as uh, some of you know, uh, the International Business School of Brandeis um, has been an important partner of World Boston for several years um, and is, is really a, a rising star in the um, business and finance education world. So uh, we're really happy about that. I can tell you more. Uh, Peter is the Carl J. Shapiro Professor of International Finance at Brandeis IBS. He is a non-resident fellow at Brookings and, um, and the uh, John L. Thornton China Center and a visiting fellow at uh, Peterson, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. His research focuses on international trade uh, finance, investment, and technological competition, primarily in Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and Peter was founding dean of the International Business School at Brandeis from uh, 1994 to 2006, and then interim dean 2016-2018. Uh, uh, he's held visiting appointments uh, at the Asian Development Bank Institute, Brookings, Fudan University, Keio University, Be uh, Peking or Beijing University. Peking, interesting, um, the OECD and the World Bank, and consults for numerous international organizations and governments. Um, he is a local guy in that he received his AB and PhD uh, in economics from Harvard, and we are so pleased uh, to welcome Peter here tonight. It was interesting, I was in China about uh, two weeks ago, and uh, I was talking with a fairly senior government official, and he said, you know, there, there are these, uh, these places like World Boston, uh, International Affairs Institutes, and you should go talk with them. <laughs> and so here I am, just two weeks later, uh, without any intervention on his part. But I, I think the point is that this institution is well known, is important, and is recognized not just in the United States, but also increasingly uh, internationally. Um, so we've got a, a, a kind of big subject on our hand, and it's very diff different from the subject that uh, I thought we would be discussing when we first uh, talked about this event in early uh, April or late March. I can't, can't remember when it was. In the meantime, um, a lot has changed, and I think the good news is that it's now June and it's just as relevant as it was in early April. Uh, in fact, the bad news is, is that it's probably more relevant than it was in early April. Um, it, the, the trade war between China and the United States has, has morphed into a technology war. And uh, that's more serious. Uh, I think in some ways it's also more appropriate that it has done that, and that's what I will be talking about for the most part today. Um, but it's a big, complex story. I, I can't possibly get into all the details of it, but, but hopefully we'll get some, to, to some of those in questions. The main U.S. concern these days is that China is stealing U.S. technology and will, in time, use it in some way against the United States. And that's really what you hear now increasingly from the President and others in Washington. Uh, U.S. sanctions now uh, focus on a symbol of Chinese technology. Uh, the company Huawei, uh, I'm sure you know about it. It is the largest uh, communications equipment company in the world. Uh, it is ahead in the 5G race, this new race to develop high-speed uh, internet networks across the world. Um, and the United States has really gone after it. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but essentially it has cut off how Huawei's access to selling products in the United States and also in many of our allies. And it has also cut off access uh, of Huawei to components that it used to buy and it had contracts to buy uh, from US companies. And it's not what Huawei has done, because it, evidently we can't really find out. There are some, uh, some examples of 
of issues with Huawei, but it's really the fear of what it might do. Uh, being very close to the Chinese government, being very close to building the basic infrastructure for networks around the world, we are worried that it might use those, combine those things, essentially give the Chinese government access through the networks through which most of our information is communicated around the world. And in effect, if you look just one step below that, uh, China is catching up in technology. And we are worried about the harm that it might do us in the future. And you hear that all the time, and especially now the administration is really more often represented by the Defense Department or by the military than by people who have long been uh, in conversations with China, who negotiated agreements with China in the, ba in, in the past. So in a way, the, the, the conversation has shifted. Many of those people are now gone from Washington. And instead, what we hear now are primarily the, the voices of the defense community. So it, it, it feels to me like this is a historic turning point. Uh, and Chinese, in the meantime, uh, their positions are hardening. Um, and our relationship is taking a, a, a kind of sudden, more ominous uh, turn. It may be, in a sense, a more honest relationship, because all these kind of deep-seated fears are now coming to the fore. But it is very troubling. So that's, that's what I will talk about, mostly. And we can discuss details of all of that also in questions that follow. Um, technological competition is a two-edged sword. Uh, technology is great. Uh, it can make lives better. It can live, make us live healthier, longer lives. It can make us more productive, and so on. Uh, but technology is also what drives all of our military machinery. Technology also threatens national security in ways more and more complex and more and more extensive uh, than it did before. So that's what this is about. Uh, I think we are, uh, by and large, happy about the good things technology does. We have policies for how to encourage and stimulate the growth of technology, but we're afraid of passing on secrets that ultimately might endanger our national security. Um, there are sort of two other themes that I, in addition to that, I'll talk about this, but there are two other themes that I'll, I'll, I'll try to discuss. Uh, and the, the second, I'm, I'm borrowing from a, a really outstanding scholar of China, a former uh, U.S. State Department official, Susan Shirk. She's a professor at the University of San Diego, uh, at the University of California in San Diego. Uh, she terms them overreach and overreaction. So her way of looking at this problem, and I think it's the right way, is that the reason that all of these uh, deep issues about technology and about the potential of poor conflict between China and the United States are suddenly coming to the fore for two reasons. One is that Chinese policies over the last few years have been what she terms overreaching, uh, that is going beyond what China uh, really uh, needs to do in order to be a, a, a kind of comfortable member of the international community. It is moving faster, and it is uh, uh, trying to impose its own uh, perspectives on the world more rapidly uh, than people are ready to accept at this point. So that's the overreach part. The other part, she says, is that the United States has been overreacting, uh, that we have, rather than try to temper these ambitions, rather than try to talk our way to a more uh, compatible relationship between the two countries, we have struck back in ways that essentially make the problem worse, that escalate uh, the relationships, conflicts, rather than try to uh, solve them. So uh, these are the, the, the two main themes. At the end, I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll see in this talk, I, I, I kind of tend to be the, kind, the person who looks for the silver lining at the end. And sure enough, I always find the silver lining. Uh, in this case, what I'm going to look for is a way for the U.S. and China to de-escalate uh, this uh, very tense relationship which is underway now and find our way, perhaps not quickly, not within next year or possibly in the next five years, but eventually uh, back to a level of cooperation which is really essential given the scale and power of these two countries. Okay, so that's the story. and. I will 
go at this and there, let me give you a, a, my first picture. Uh, there is a wonderful story associated with the big picture on the right. That's the ping pong player who started ping pong diplomacy, which eventually led to President Nixon's visit to China in 1972. And I thought it'd be interesting to put up here because we're back to playing ping pong, but it's a little more frightening ping pong than the, the kind he was playing back then. Uh, the plan of the talk is I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about how countries learn to Im innovate because I don't think in this discussion that has really gotten enough uh, play. I think we sort of tend to look behind, uh, beyond how countries learn to innovate and assume them behaving in ways that they cannot be expected to behave for a very long time after they learn to innovate. So that's one uh, issue I'll talk about. I'll talk about how the China-U.S. relationship worked from 1972 to 2007. That's 35 years. It's a long time. And it worked quite well. And suddenly, in 2008, since 2008, things have gone downhill, especially so uh, recently. But I think we tend to forget that these two countries do know how to cooperate. They have ways of cooperating, and it's a matter really of, of trying to find our way back to those cooperative mechanisms rather than being um, very gloomy about the future of the relationship. So that's, that's the silver, you, you see the silver lining appearing again in my, in my talk here. Okay, so let me turn first uh, to my story about how countries learn to innovate. So that's, that's the first, uh, first uh, piece of my talk, and I'm going to start actually close to home. Uh, close to home in two senses. The, the place uh, that I'm going to talk about is Waltham, Massachusetts. Brandeis University is located in Waltham, Massachusetts. The, the buildings that I will show you are just down the street from us. Uh, very beautiful buildings still exist. And I will talk about a person who is a Boston person, uh, Francis Cabot Lowell, a businessman who, you know, one of the many, many Cabots and Lowells and who uh, uh, populate our history. Um, who was involved in the China trade. Now, being involved in the China trade meant he, he signed on as a, as a young man to be the merchant on a ship that went to India and China. Uh, he bought silk and tea in China uh, to sell in the United States. What do you pay them with? Well, you can't really pay them with dollars. They didn't really want gold. You paid them essentially with opium that you bought in India. So. Lowell was one of a very large group of traders who at the time initiated what was the opium trade. The opium trade eventually led to a series of wars uh, 50 or so years later. This was just at the end of the 18th century. But anyway, in 1800s, uh, a war began in Europe. And what the Europeans started to do is to capture American ships uh, because they were afraid that America would aid one side or the other. This was the French and the, French and the English. And the United States, States in 1807 uh, passed uh, the 1807 Embargo Act, which meant you were simply not allowed to take your ships out to sea. You were not allowed to trade with anybody. That was to protect American ships and to preserve the, the neutrality of the United States. Lowell had a problem. His livelihood was the trade, the Asia trade. He had established the India Wharf, by the way. If you go to the India Wharf, that is a low initial investment. He started to look for a new business. He had heard that uh, uh, in Lancashire, England, there was this new invention being put to use. It was the power loom. OK, this is a picture of Lancashire, England in about that time. This is a picture of many, many power looms. You can see the power looms all, all across this factory floor. Those are uh, women who were operators of the power loom. This was a very new invention, and suddenly it made the production of fabrics far more efficient, far less costly uh, than they had been before when basically human labor had to be used to, to, to do this. Uh, Lowell had good access to these factories because he was, as a trader, very well connected. He went to the factories, he looked at the machines, he memorized the machines, he went to his hotel room at night, uh, uh, drew pictures of the equipment, of the machinery. 
and I, I guess you can see where I'm heading with this. And he eventually started to go back to the United States with the intent of creating uh, a, a factory similar to this. Uh, the British were suspicious. Uh, the only reason Lowe got access to these places was because he was very well connected. But they saw that he had something more in mind. They searched his ships as he went home. But by that time, he had memorized all of his drawings. There were no drawings on board, and they had to let him go. The, uh, the penalty for the theft of intellectual property, that is the penalty for drawing pictures of British machines and taking them to the United States to make copies of them, at the time was death. So we are kind of lucky that that didn't happen to Lowell because all of the wonderful technological story of Massachusetts would not be uh, here today, or at least not in the, the same way. Anyway, Lowell got back built the first factory in Waltham, right at the center of Waltham. That's the factory, the Lowell Mill in Waltham, Massachusetts. That's the Charles River in, in Waltham. Uh, it has a waterfall on which uh, the factory was powered. Turned out to be uh, too little a factory. He had to eventually uh, uh, move and establish larger factories nearby. That's how the city of Lowell uh, was established. And from there on, the story speeds up. Uh, from these two factories in Waltham and Lowell uh, emerged a whole large textile industry in New England, which became the largest in the world at one point. From that, uh, machine manufacturing, precision ma machine manufacturing. From that, manufacturing watches. Uh, watches became, the Waltham watch became the world's watchmaking center with a little bit of technological borrowing from Switzerland. That, that was part of the story, too. So uh, I think you see where I'm going. Uh, a lot of these early, uh, a lot of these early inventions in the United States were imitating inventions which were at that time uh, being pioneered by a more advanced uh, economy, which was, which was England. But that didn't last long. Uh, eventually, uh, the Boston area be, uh, established its own centers of innovation. MIT was founded later on in, uh, in that century. And eventually, uh, as, as we all know, became the technological hub uh, of the United States until San Francisco unfairly took away some of our industries. But here we are, nevertheless, uh, 200 years later, as a major global center of technology. Uh, and you can trace, if, if I'd like to do this at some point when, when I get retired, is to trace step by step the evolution of technologies from one investment in one mill back in 1816 to the advanced uh, technologies uh, that, that we see around us uh, today. Um, here is a biographer talking about Lowell. Lowell possessed a combination of ability, ambition, wealth, connections, and risk-taking that would come to define later generations of American entrepreneurs. He established much more than ex textile mill in Waltham. He helped to inaugurate a culture of innovation that has driven the world economy ever since. And that plant, by the way, was called the Waltham Lowell System. So 200 years fast forward. I put on this slide here four major Chinese uh, companies. Uh, Ping An is the number one insurance company in the world. These are not, the numbers don't refer to rankings in China. They refer to rankings in the world. Uh, Huawei is the number one communications equipment company. Tencent is the number one game company. It also has a very large social network uh, operation. And BYD is the world's second largest electric car company. The first largest is Tesla. So the question I'm asking here is, what do these companies have in common? Um, and this is a big audience, so I won't, I, I, I won't play the, the full guessing game. But let me tell you two things that they have in common that add a third that is also important. The two that they have in common is that they were all established uh, in the 19, late 1980s or later. Uh, these are companies that are young. Uh, nevertheless, they are at the top of their industries in the world. Second, they were established in a city called Shenzhen, uh, 
uh, a, a city that I'll show you pictures of in a second in, in southern China near Hong Kong. And the third thing that they have in common is that if you look back into the history of these companies, there is a fair amount of imitation, at least at the outset. For example, BYD's initial car looked an awful lot like the Toyota. Uh, Huawei, uh, back in its early days, uh, was, was, was in reinventing, uh, reverse engineering is, I think, the term that is, 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 is the polite way to put it, uh, products that were used in very early computer networks. But that was 20 or 30 years ago. Just as Boston, I don't think one would argue, is essentially founded or continues to uh, be a center for innovation because it copies technology, none of the companies on this picture are, are any longer in the business of mainly living off somebody else's technology. On the contrary, they are themselves innovators and at the frontier in, in many of their fields. Okay, so let me show you a little bit more about Shenzhen. This is Shenzhen. Uh, I don't actually know exactly when this picture is. 1920s is when I would guess. It was a small fishing village. It's 20 miles from Hong Kong. And then in 1979, soon after Nixon had visited China, uh, the leader of, of China at that time, Deng Xiaoping, uh, felt that it was essential for China to look outward. He established four economic uh, zones, free economic zones. Shenzhen was particularly attractive because it was near Hong Kong. And the idea of these zones was that they would be kind of windows on the west. They would import not so much uh, technology. I think in those days, people didn't expect China to, to learn an awful lot from Western technology, but Western ways of doing business. And Shenzhen became uh, a center for attracting uh, entrepreneurs from Hong Kong setting up businesses that they, uh, uh, that they initially owned and, and managed. Uh, this is Shenzhen in 1981, very soon after uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping had named it uh, an economic zone, a special economic zone. You see a few cranes in that picture, and you see a few buildings, but mostly you see the same old uh, beach uh, that used to be the fishing village. And this is Shenzhen in 2018. It is now a city of 23 million people. Uh, the greater metropolitan area of Shenzhen is 23 million people. It is known as the, uh, uh, as the uh, Silicon Valley of China. It has, in addition to the first uh, slide, the leading companies in the first slide, a, a number of, of uh, outstanding, uh, large, globally significant companies. Uh, the difference between Shenzhen and Boston, actually, if you look kind of carefully, there aren't so many differences except the speed with which they developed. Uh, in Boston, it took us, you know, somewhere on the order of 150, 200 years. In Shenzhen, it took less than 30. Uh, and the scale now is about four times that of, of our city. But the spirit of these two cities is remarkably similar, and you can feel that, actually, in a place. By the way, the, the Shenzhen uh, model is called uh, Shanzai system, you know, just like there was the, the Waltham Lowell system, there is a Shanzai system which, which amounts to uh, being able to produce very new technologies from components that are kind of tailor-made for you in various factories in Shenzhen within a matter of days. And so it's a, it's a different, obviously different way of doing business, but as just as innovative. Takeaways from this. Uh, uh, imitation is the beginning of every technology story. Uh, and I can't think of anyone, whether it's Japan or Korea or China or the United States, where imitation was not a critical part. Where else do you learn how to do state-of-the-art things except from people who happen to be leaders at that time? So that's one important takeaway. Second, imitation is almost never the story that more advanced uh, stages of the technological development take. And just as Boston is no longer an imitator, it is very much in the lead in technology, so is in many ways Shenzhen uh, in the technolo technological lead. Um, the, uh, the last piece of this is that technology and prosperity uh, and national security are all kind of interwoven. It's not an accident, by the way, that the United Technologies Raytheon merger uh, 
which will make the second largest defense contractor in the United States, has decided to locate its headquarters in Boston because it's very near the, the commercial technologies that are so essential to make military technologies excellent. So there is this kind of close interrelationship between military and commercial technologies, and that's what creates problems. Uh, that's what makes it very difficult to, uh, uh, to essentially uh, uh, cooperate without at the same time potentially threatening uh, national security. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, uh, I'm done with these slides, so let me just turn this off or maybe put back the initial side. Okay, I'll put this one back. Uh, because what I want to now uh, spend a few minutes on are how we managed to get along with China in the old, er early years of our relationship. Uh, how uh, the process went off the rails starting roughly nine, in 2008, and how we might nevertheless uh, be able to find our way back again to greater cooperation in the future. So that's the last piece of, of my talk. Let me just say uh, that the 35 years after President Nixon went to China uh, were uh, extraordinary. China at that time began as a defunct economy, a uh, society which had been torn apart by the Cultural Revolution. In the next 30 years, it privatized agriculture, privatized much of industry, uh, established markets, uh, opened to the West, became the wor world's largest trader, and it established a financial system very much like a Western financial system and an international currency. In 2001, China joined the World Trade Organization uh, on terms that at the time people said were so onerous that they violate fundamental principles of the WTO. And China still today, 15 years later, uh, remains subject to controls that other countries simply uh, don't have to obey. Um, and in the meantime, China delivered very large benefits for the United States. Uh, Robert Lawrence, uh, uh, an economist at Harvard, estimates about $13,000 per family uh, was the effect of having China come on board. Um, this was the largest uh, political, economic, social tra transition I think ever made in human history. It eventually moved a, million, a billion people, a billion people, about 80% uh, of the Chinese population from poverty to above the poverty line. And I think people who say that we, you know, we tried working with China, it never, never gets anywhere, simply don't uh, somehow remember or weren't there for this 35 years of really extraordinary changes which moved China much closer uh, to the West than one would have ever imagined them to be in 1972. So let me then turn to the more ominous era after 2008. Uh, 2008 was the year of the financial crisis. Uh, initially, Chinese reform stopped. Uh, they did a lot uh, to stimulate their own economy and in the process were able to bring a lot to, to stabilize a lot of the world economy as well. But then came Xi Jinping, the new president of China, and he's a very interesting character, a very complex character, a very tough person. Uh, his father had dedicated his life to the Communist Party and then was purged during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Xi at one point was on a stage being ridiculed by, his mother had to ridicule him for having been his father's son. So imagine that scene. Um, his sister, his elder sister, she was a half-sister, uh, died during the Cultural Revolution. And I think if, if you sort of look at what's behind that person, uh, one thing that has to be really important to his personality is the, is the search for stability, for kind of control, Party control is the way he interprets it. That will prevent such chaos from ever happening again. Um, this explains why he has spent so much time uh, uh, strengthening the control of the Communist Party in China, while he has once again made state-owned enterprises larger, and while he, why he has engaged in surveillance of uh, populations that he doesn't trust. Now, the interesting thing about this, I think, is that she did this or could do this because in the meantime, the US model had lost its luster. 
the United States had just led the world into something very close to the Second Great Recession, uh, Second Great Depression. So some of the natural pushback that would have come within China uh, basically didn't have credibility because the Western model itself was failing. Reaction was needed. Some of the reaction came within China, and if you talked with intellectuals then, uh, you knew that it was there, but they simply didn't have the power to oppose the, the strength of his, uh, uh, his views. Um, President Obama, by the way, also started pushing back. Uh, he started the Pacific pivot, uh, shifting a large amount of Navy into the Pacific, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was to be a large trade agreement essentially made up of countries around China along very much the principles that we're now trying to negotiate with China, that President Trump is now trying to negotiate with China, but uh, excluding China, and China would have had to have eventually uh, become part of the TPP. Would this have worked? Uh, I, I think yes, if it had been a little more aggressive, if it had been given a little more time, and given the very uh, real recovery of the US economy. But we never found that out. And that's the second part of the, of, the, uh, of the negative part of the story, which is that then came U.S. overreaction. And the U.S. has struck China, I think, over the last uh, couple of years economically harder than any country has been struck uh, in peacetime. I mean, of course, in, in periods of war, uh, relationships are cut off. But, but we have, over the last two years, have more or less done the same thing. Imagine uh, foreign power arresting the daughter of somebody like Steve Jobs. Uh, imagine a foreign power isolating our kind of iconic company like Apple, uh, making it impossible for it to do business worldwide and denying it uh, important components. Imagine imposing taxes of potentially 150 billion on all of the exports uh, of the United States by a foreign power. So we are, uh, we are really in the midst of a very aggressive pushback against China, a pushback that probably has its rationale, but in its form, in its current form, in its very aggressive form, is likely to be generating uh, more harm than good. Um, so let me turn, finally, for a couple of minutes to where we go from here. I think uh, Yogi Berra is, is the one that I keep thinking of in this context. If He said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up someplace else. <laughs> and uh, that's sort of what this feels like right now, is we have uh, 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 ostensibly uh, uh, an objective uh, to bring China into the world community, but in fact are pushing at it in ways that are likely to uh, create a greater gulf between it and the rest of the world. We are the two largest uh, countries in the world. We have immense power to damage each, each other. And we have immense power to do good together. And by that, I mean, of course, climate, uh, inventing the future of work, uh, working with aging, health, and so on. And our people, really, if you look at them closely, and I'm kind of familiar with a lot of the interactions between these two cultures, really do get along pretty well. So uh, I don't think there is a plan B. I think plan A has to be to work together again in the future. It has to be to recreate institutions in which we can talk and in which we can develop policies that are, uh, that are more compatible. And we need the rest of the world involved. China and the US are very big, but two thirds of the world is not us. It's the rest of the world and they have an awful lot at stake in how the US-China relationship works out. And beneath all that, and that's where I'll end, uh, the people communications and connections are what is really critical. And so in, in, in this area, I really feel so more and more good, better and better, one might say, about the work that I have been doing at, at, as a professor at a university. And let me, by the way, say I know my school, I know my students, I know my programs, but a lot of Boston is doing the same thing. And a lot of Boston is doing this like no other city uh, in the world is doing it. Uh, I travel often to China. I have colleagues, students, research projects there. I speak of often uh, to Chinese audiences. Uh, 
At Brandeis, I teach students uh, who are often uh, from China and from many other parts of the world. Um, and uh, I helped uh, build a school which is, which is built on international cooperation and brings people together from all around the world. And again, let me just say this. This is my, my narrow Brandeis perspective. But you could say the same thing, obviously, about Harvard, about MIT, about Boston University, Tufts, uh, Boston College, and I'm sure I'm forgetting Northeastern. Uh, we are a place that is doing the right thing. Uh, and it's that human level relationships, including what World Boston is doing, uh, that, I'm, uh, that I'm hopeful will bring us back to a, a more satisfactory relationship again. Thank you. Well, it may be uh, overreach and overreaction, or it may be uh, Thucydides' trap. Uh, but this uh, real question is uh, whether there's room in the world for more than one hegemon. It still hasn't been sorted out yet. So what is uh, overreach? Obviously, China is uh, entering into your area of the world, into Eastern Europe, Hungary, and so forth. They signed up for the Belt and Road Initiative. How far does this reach go, and how far will the reaction, or how soon will the reaction come? Uh, it seems to be that the trade is just symptomatic of a struggle over uh, global hegemony and whether we're going to have a multipolar world. Is, is that where we're really headed? Can we really contain it within over? reach and uh, over uh, reaction or is that going to lead to sparks hi uh, probably a similar question you started the talk uh, with uh, Lowell who kind of took ideas from England I was just wondering at what point did America and European countries start willingly sharing information and what does China have to do to prove that there are allies and not adversaries that we could share information with and not be some kind of thief versus, um, I guess, adversaries in this whole situation. Thank you. You know, the, the, the basic idea of Thucydides' trap, uh, you may be familiar with it. The, the argument is that when one power passes another, when you have a very fast-growing power that passes at some point uh, the level of power of the incumbent you're likely to get war. The data for that is about as bad as you can possibly get. Uh, there are 16 cases, supposedly, that uh, are measured that way, and I don't believe that. So I, you know, I, I understand the threat. I think it's, it's very clear that this kind of tit-for-tat uh, reaction that the incumbent power may take against the rising power may eventually lead to a... Uh, to a uh, a stalemate in which nothing but uh, ultimately ultimate collision works. I don't like that answer. Imagine a kind of global confrontation between China and the United States. And I, I, neither of us is going for at least the next uh, 40 or 50 years, I would think, have such a clear advantage that the other would be afraid to fight. I think this is, this is really a recipe for extraordinary disaster. And I think, frankly, that people on both sides fully understand that. I think the militaries on both sides fully understand that. So I don't think we have to go there. It's, uh, it's a risk. Uh, it's, and I think Graham Allison, who is the author of that uh, thesis, uh, actually uses it not so much to say this is what's going to happen, but says, look, you have to pay attention to this because we have to find alternatives. Now, that actually works, uh, I think, uh, works, I think, well with the second question, which is how do we share information if we're afraid of the information being shared, uh, strengthening the power of the other uh, country? And the answer is that, you know, at, at some point, if you have no trust at all, you don't share very much information uh, because even information that does not contribute to the military or security risk uh, might make the other country economically stronger. Uh, but again, if you, if you think about what that means in our current world, um, uh, we, the United States and China, uh, are not alone. China is going to, given how wealthy it is, given how much power it has, it is going to have allies. Uh, and I just don't think we can turn off an economy which has been as powerful as it has been and remains powerful uh, from continuing to develop and grow stronger. Uh, a much better strategy is to try to figure out what information we can share and what information we really do have to wall off. 
Uh, we have very good systems for that in the United States. We have export controls and investment controls, which make sure that sensitive technologies can be monitored and ultimately not passed on uh, to the Chinese or the Russians or anybody else for that matter that we feel threatens us. So these, uh, these things exist, and I think they can be used provided that there is a minimum level of trust between the countries themselves. Now, we are not there right now, and I'm, I'm perfectly uh, uh, ready to, to uh, admit that. Uh, but what I'd like us to remember is we're talking about five or ten years, roughly, in which this train has gone off the rails. Uh, do we want, on the basis of that five or ten years of the train going off the rails, make commitments that might drive us uh, apart in the next 50? And I think it's too early to say that. I think what we should do is, is begin doing exactly what we are now doing in terms of trying to negotiate some kind of an interim uh, period in which the countries can begin to explore whether their interests are really diametrically opposed. I don't think they are. I think for the most part they are, they are quite close. And whether, given that framework, we can develop a trust which brings us back to being able to cooperate again and use mechanisms which can separate uh, the defense uh, risks from cooperation on many other, in many other areas. Yeah, I'm just curious what you think the outcome will be of the current trade war with China. Um, what type of a timeline are we looking at, and are we going to see any benefits um, at all as Americans uh, from it? Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the emphasis on protectionism as opposed to innovation. And I'm not referring to concerns about military secrets, but I think a lot of companies are focused more on keeping down uh, a new competitor than trying to push their own innovation. And I think if you look, for example, at Apple and Microsoft in the days when, when Apple had the clear lead in the graphical user interface with the Macintosh, they spent forever on a lawsuit, uh, really lost a lot of position. And when they abandoned that and uh, started innovating again, they really pushed, pushed way to the front. Prediction for the future of the trade war. Oh boy, I wish I were that smart. Uh, this, uh, it, it changes very, very frequently. As you know, we are back in negotiations of sorts again after the negotiations collapse because uh, President Trump will meet President Xi in, in Japan next week. Um, I think the degree, the, the heat which this uh, trade war has generated uh, is something that is beginning to bother both countries a lot. Uh, I think President Trump thought that he would have a quick victory. He didn't get that. Uh, and uh, Chinese, in the meantime, the economy is suffering very uh, severely under the, under the sanctions of the United States. So my, my guess is something will happen that will at least cool this off. Uh, how long that will last, who knows? Uh, we, we really still have some very fundamental differences, and I think this last question illustrates that. I mean, if the issue is that the United States simply wants to keep China from developing, that is not something that China is going to be able to agree to. Uh, but there has to be something in between those, uh, those extremes, uh, and, and I suspect that eventually we'll find it. But right now, what's critical is to de-escalate. Uh, we have kind of moved into a, a tit-for-tat, uh, higher, uh, higher tariffs, uh, higher sanctions, uh, that just makes uh, both sides uh, harden. Uh, let me just say, sir, this question of what will the United States get out of a deal. I think the, 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 basically what the United States will get out of a trade deal with China is that it can remove the tariffs that we have imposed on our own uh, uh, consumers uh, and have raised the prices uh, to our own consumers. What we get from this is not that there will be suddenly some great new benefit that the Chinese will provide us. We can, the benefit is that we no longer have to, we can stop shooting ourselves in the foot, so to speak. Uh, the protectionism is not the way uh, to get there. Uh, it, is, it is very costly, far more costly uh, than whatever uh, intellectual property theft uh, China may be engaged in. We have to stop that. That's, uh, maybe that's the value of this very aggressive negotiation, is that they'll pull back from that. I hope so. Uh, 
but the key benefit for us will be to, uh, to be able to stop what we are now doing. We don't see that right now because our economy is incredibly strong. Uh, but, uh, but it's there beneath it, and in fact, in many of the, many of the projections of where the econ U.S. economy, the world economy are headed, you already see uh, some of those uh, negatives. Um, in terms of protectionism, I, I think the, the ultimate vision is uh, China is a huge innovative power. I mean, we can benefit from the innovations that they are pioneering just like they can from the innovations that we are pioneering. The, the ultimate story of this ought to be collaboration, uh, not, not so much collaboration on any one project, but, but in being able to trade uh, uh, discoveries that one country makes versus the other. Chinese have now, at this point, more scientific manpower than the United States has in research laboratories. Uh, their expenditures on research and development are very close to those of the United States and will probably exceed ours, ours in, in a few years. So this is, we are moving in a world where sharing the benefits of two extremely productive countries uh, are the ultimate source of benefit to us both. The question is whether we as human beings can figure out a way of getting there without, uh, without letting somehow conflict and war drive us into corners that we don't want to go. That remains to be, that remains to be settled. Could you comment on how Xi and the Communist Party's fear of the rule of law affects both the potential development of China and the potential to work out a working relationship with the United States? Uh, Yes, very negatively, I think, is, is the answer. Um, you know, this is, this is really the story of what happened in 2008. I mean, I think until then, things were on a very positive track. Uh, and I think two things happened in 2008. One is this kind of loss of confidence in the Western model, which the Great uh, uh, Recession generated, and the other is the ascendance of Xi as a, as, as a leader of China. He, he had a kind of vision which I think we were a bit surprised at and which I think the Chinese themselves were surprised at and probably would have resisted uh, had there been uh, a, a kind of more, uh, a better story to tell about how they should continue re reforms. So now we're, we're at this impasse. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's still very possible for that resistance to rise in China. I think the, the Hong Kong story is interesting itself. It, it shows that there is a, a great deal of passion uh, among the Chinese people uh, in, in, in moving in, in, in far more open ways. Question is, can, can, we, can we sort of move in that direction uh, without the great disruption that it might include, involve. And we don't, that's, that's the other big question mark, is can China itself turn that corner internally? Hong Kong is separate. It can do a lot of things. But can, can China make that turn internally uh, without the kind of disruption that they can't themselves tolerate? I hope they can. And, and I think our effort ought to be to help them do that to the extent possible.